anin in the way mag and attack ni ka koi ki dimagas nun ka bin ai si koi id ko makwa in no dem ka ba sa ge ganing in dun jaba ni kwich in the way mag and attack ni kwich bujun ni ji koi wak um i'm giving you my language which is nishnabeg and um thanking you for the honor of being here tonight um and I'm um, telling you where I'm from, which is uh, I'm, that I'm Bear Clan, Mississippi band from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. And just telling you a little bit about our area and um, thanking you all for coming tonight. And um, in, our, in our way, we uh, refer to everyone as our relations because we are all related and, uh, and uh, acknowledging that. And um, in, in being asked to discuss uh, these issues of spirituality and policy and society, um, it is, it is a, a challenge to anyone to kind of grapple with these issues. And I, I need to kind of issue a disclaimer and that I, you know, I, I, I practice as best as I can walking on this earth, you know, that's what I'd say. But I'm certainly not a scholar on native religious practices, uh, nor am I someone who knows about, um, you know, all these different things. I, I practice in our own way in our community. I'm a traditional practitioner, but there are many people who, um, have way many more years um, on this earth that have had a lot more experience in these things than I. And so I'll try to express to you the best as I can on these issues. But I think it's important to um, you know, just really be honest with you in that I, I'm going to speak from my own experience and uh, the life that I've led um, and the honor that I had in my life uh, to meet you know, people like Shelley. Um, like people in all, all areas in our community who struggle on these issues, and um, people who have immense dignity, and are asking basically a simple question, which is you know, the question of how to walk the path that the Creator gave you. They're asking to do that. Oh, am I, am I falling away? Oh, I'm too soft. My children would never say that that is possible. <coughs> um, I have a friend out there who knows how my children are. They think I'm very very loud and abrasive. Um, but uh, there are, you know, I've, in the, I've had the honor of my life to, uh, to uh, meet many of these people who just ask this simple question, to live in dignity, to be able to pray at their sacred sites, uh, to be able to carry on their religious practice, uh, to be able to walk, you know, essentially that path that the Creator gave them. And that is in the, in the days, uh, in the era of globalization or in the continuation of, of globalization in the era in which we find ourselves. That is, it seems like an immense challenge. And um, so I will kind of tell you some of those stories as best as I can, but that is where I've learned from. And what I would like to say is that um, in starting, I would like to talk about a couple of prophecies for our people. And I would say that these are significant prophecies not only to Anishinaabe people, but to, or to Lakota people, but to all indigenous peoples. And I say this because I know quite honestly, you know, here in Seattle we are much more perhaps astute and thoughtful and politically correct, um, we think anyway, than in other areas in the country. But quite often, to be honest, there is a there is pretty much a, a across the board dismissal of uh, native. Uh, prophecies or native uh, teachings as being interesting and folkloric. Um, you know, for instance, our, our stories, uh, some of our most significant stories are taught kind of uh, in the folklore anthropology section, you know, in these universities. And, and when we talk about whether it is native philosophy, it's, it is not held in the same regard as that perhaps which might come from Europe or our scientific knowledge, which we wouldn't call scientific knowledge, we would call it our, our, our knowledge of the creation. It is not held in the same regard. It is, it is as a consequence of the set of relations between Native people and non-Native people in this society, it is, it is quite frankly held in lower regard. And uh, that is one of the challenges we face as Native people is, um, is this long history. And when I tell you these stories tonight or these prophecies, I'll tell you that we hold them in very high regard. And that when I tell you these things, I tell you because uh, in our community, we think that perhaps there is something to learn from them. And in our work, in my own work, in my own community, they guide our work, they guide our work. So there are two prophecies. One prophecy I'll tell you 
It is a long time ago, it's called the People of the Seventh Fire, which is Anishinaabeg prophecy from our community. And uh, they say that a long, long time ago that uh, these uh, teachers came, and each society has teachers that come. You always need teachers that come and tell you how to be better humans. You know, because we are not so smart that we can usually figure that out on our own. You know, you go along and try to do the best you can, but you need someone to come tell you that. And uh, these people came to us, and they talked about these times, and they called those the times of the seven fires. And they said, what would happen in each of those times? And in the course of those times, they talked about, for instance, when we were on the East Coast, they talked about in us being on the East Coast that we would move west. We would move west, we would follow a shell in the sky. And as we followed that shell in the sky, we would move to this place where the food grows upon the water, which is what they say is wild rice. The food grows upon the water, and that's where we would move to. And they talked about how hard times would come to our people in, this, in the third, fourth, fifth fire. Times would come where, where uh, people would come from a different place, and some of them would be good-hearted and some would not. You know, that is true. You know, people came from someplace else, and some of them were really good-hearted, and some were really not. You know, and they talked about that time would come. And then they talked about that our people would be in disarray. You know, that we would lose many things. Many of our people would die. 90% depopulation. That's what happened to most indigenous communities, 90% depopulation. They talked about that that, thing, that would happen, and that we would lose many of our people. And then we would lose many of our things. They talk about that. We lose many of our things, they say which is what you see, you know, or I cannot believe, you know, a, a lot of our things are still in museums. A lot of our people, as you know, are still in these museums, these different places. You know, it broke my heart. I visit with these Haida people, and I didn't know that some of their whole, their whole villages were hauled off to museums, you know? Just to totally imagine, you know, that conceptually, I cannot imagine hauling off an entire village, you know, to put it in a museum. But the immensity of that loss to our communities, it's hard to express. But I say that because it's a grief. It is a, it's a historic grief and it's a present grief when that happens to you when, you're, when your sacred bundles and all your things and your ancestors are in these museums. But they talked about that that would happen. And then they talk about how after a, you know, after a time we would start to get those things back and that's what you see. And as I sit here and I'm able to talk to you tonight, it is ironic that it was not, it was just a little over 20 years ago when the United States government finally passed the American Indian Religious Freedom Act in this country, which recognized our right to practice our religion, which is important when a country which is founded on religious freedom. That in 1978, finally, 200 years later, essentially, there was a recognition that we would have a right to practice our religion, but some serious omissions in that in itself. And that it seems that you cannot practice your religion if you want to practice in a place where they want to log, they want to mine, or they want to climb, you know? And now that's, you know, but I say that because that is a part of our whole struggle to recover that dignity of just trying to walk that path that you have, that the Creator gave you, trying to do something simple like that. They talked about that time and they said in that time that we would start recovering things. And then they said Ashki Anishinaabeg, the Ashki Anishinaabeg would be, would come. And they call that the people of the seventh fire. And they said that, that is the time now when the Ashki Anishinaabeg would come the new people, that's how they refer to us. And they say that, you know, we will have, have gone through these things and we'll be a little different, but we will go and we will recover things which are along the way. We'll stand up as new people, and in that time when we are these new people, that we will have a chance to make a choice. And they say that there are two paths ahead for us, Ashki and Anishinaabeg people. They say the one path they refer to as a path that is well-worn, but it is scorched. That's what they said. A path that is well-worn, but it is scorched. And the second path, they say, is green. That's what they say. They say that we have that path, and it is a green path. And they say that that is the choice that we have as, uh, as Ashki and Anishinaabeg. So I share that prophecy with you, that teaching that we have, because that very much guides the work that we do in our community, in our own uh, you know, humble way on the White Earth Reservation at the White Earth Land Recovery Project. But it is something that some of us feel, um, well, we are told that that has a broader set of implications, that uh, we, we all have this choice as the, as the new people. The second prophecy I, I uh, share briefly with you, I, I uh, share it because I work on this issue. And uh, I'm going to talk more about it later. I'll talk about both these things. But I'm not a Lakota. 
And, um, you know, but I had the honor of working with uh, some of these people, and uh, I work on this uh, trying, to, trying to stand up for Mushka to Abijiki, our elder brother, the buffalo. And there was a teaching of a long time ago that uh, when, uh, that a long time ago, this woman came to the Lakota people, and she was called the White Buffalo Calf Woman. And she came, and uh, when she arrived, their community was in, in some disarray, like all of our communities get to, you know? And uh, this woman came, and she, she taught that community how to, how to pray, how to talk to the Creator, which is one of the greatest gifts you can have, is how to talk to the Creator, you know? And uh, she, gave, she gave those ceremonies, and it is, you know, it's, it, there's some stories about how it was she came, and, and uh, you know, that confusion about that time. But then they said that uh, she walked away, and uh, when she walked away, she rolled, and she turned into a white buffalo calf, and then she rolled again, she rolled again, she rolled again, and she walked away as a, as a, as a buffalo calf. Different colors she turned to each time. And they said that one day she would return. That's what they said, one day she would return. And here it was just a few years ago, some of you may recall, that a white buffalo calf was born to a uh, farmer in Wisconsin. Hyder, I think his name is Dave Hyder. Very nice guy, you know. This white buffalo calf is known as Miracle. Uh, and if you go out there, you'll see that there are tens of thousands of, of prayer um, offerings that were given by people. Because when they saw that return, that was prophesized. That was prophesized. And they said that when that return would happen, when the white buffalo calf would return, that it would be a time of change in a time when there would be the beginning of finding of a, of a um, harmony, that the different colors would start to come together. So I share those stories with you, those two stories. And um, you can, uh, you know, they're, they're told in, in some of our communities and there are people who tell them much better than I. But the reason I share them with you is that those actually guide some of the work that a lot of our communities do. And in the case of us, uh, you know, in, in my work, they, they guide us. And they are not things that we romanticize or trivialize or, or put aside. They're things that we view and hold them as a wellspring of practice to understand where we are and where we are going. And it is said sometimes that people, like Indian people, that we want to go back. We don't want to go back. So this kind of, I think that that is part of the trivializing of us as Indian people. They say, oh, those Indian people, they want to go back and be like it was. And it is not about that. It is not about going back. It is about finding your life way. That's what they say. It is about finding your life way, the path that you are given, so that you can walk ahead on that path. That's what it is. It's about finding the life way. It's not about going back. It's about finding that life way returning to the life way, if that is what they call it. But it's not something that is in the past. It is something which is present and it is something which is in the future. Now, I tell you that because um, this is what guides uh, much of our work. But also, when I consider those things, what is our life way? What is our life way? And I will talk a little, you know, if you will really call it philosophically about what it is, this, this meaning, this minopamata siwan, minopamata siwan. That's what a word is in our language, which means the good life, the good life. The alternate translation is continuous rebirth. That's the alternate translation of that, of that phrase. And I'm, I'm not a very good speaker of Ojibwe. I must say, I'm in a, I'm in a pretty extensive Ojibwe program in my uh, community, but I'm still someone who, uh, you know, when I talk, they ask me, you know, those, those old people, I go to ceremonies and they say, you know, Winona, you talk good in English, you should talk so good in Ojibwe. <laughs> so I'm working, I'm working, you know, when I talk and they, they lean over a little bit like this when I'm talking sometimes. And they say, I think what she's saying is. <laughs> so I don't want you to think that I'm a very good speaker, but I'm okay, you know, I'm working at it. Minopamata Siwan, that's what that means though. They walk along in a good way. They walk on that path. What does that mean? What does that mean? I want to tell you a few things about what I think that that means. And I, this is what I have gleaned from talking to, listening to those old people talk and having them listen to me and they say, oh, you should say it like this. That's how they talk to me. Say it like this. That's what they say, you know? They say that natural law is the highest law. That's what they say. That's our teaching. Natural law is the highest law. 
higher than the laws made by nations, states, or municipalities. And one would do well to live in accordance with natural law. That's what they say. Because they say if you do not do so, that would be kind of foolish. That would kind of make an assumption that you've got a better way figured out. And uh, in the smallness that we are in that web of life, that would be kind of, in our assessment, a big gamble. You know? So we try to live as best as we can in accordance with natural law. How do we know what is natural law? We have two sources of our knowledge. First thing, intergenerational residency. What's that mean? It means if you live for a thousand years in an ecosystem, you've got a pretty good idea how things are. You know? My children's grandpa, I always tell this story about him. His name is James Small. He's from James Bay in northern Quebec. He's not in your in the teachings here that they would have, very educated man. You know, went to school to eighth grade. That James Small. But that James Small, he's a trapper. Lives out there in the brush most of the year in the bush. And uh, one year I'm up there with him and he says to me, he says, Winona, you know that, um, Winona, you know that the uh, Martins are migrating west. So he says to me, you know, y'all know what a Martin is? You know, you're an environmentalist, you call it just, right? Martins. <laughs> furry animals, those guys. I said, what do you mean martins are migrating west? He says, the martins, once every 70 years, the martins migrate west. That's what he says to me. You know, now who the heck's going to know that? <laughs> you know, who's been up to James Bay for that long? Only them Crees. You know, those Inuits. Those people. That's why people have been up there 280, 350 years to see that migration, you know, when they do this, you know, this activity. That's intergenerational residency in place, you know? That's what he says. And I say that to you because the irony is, is that someone like uh, James Small or, or um, James Garrett or these different Indian people who know this intergenerational knowledge of place are not considered qualified to sit at the table in public policy meetings. They're not considered qualified to teach at universities like this because they don't have a PhD. You know, they're not considered qualified in, in public hearing processes. You know? But at the same time, I think sometimes things maybe change a little bit. Interestingly enough here, in accordance with natural law, last year there was a, there was a gathering sponsored by NASA down in Albuquerque. I didn't get the opportunity to go to it, but I asked those people what it was like. NASA called together a bunch of uh, elders from the Indian community to ask them what they thought about global warming. You know? And I thought that was an interesting thing. You know, they asked those people what they thought about global warming. And those uh, Indian people, they, they listened to those NASA guys and they, you know, showed them all these things about this is, this is defrosting, this is moving, you know? So the Indians said, yeah, we know that. You know, we could have told you that 20 years ago. You know? I mean, you live out there in the brush or in the, on the tundra, you know what's going on. You know, it's not like you don't, you don't need a bunch of people with computer models to tell you that. You, know, you observe that. You observe that. And those scientists said, so what you Indian people, what do you think about that? What should we do? That's what they asked those elders. And those elders said, this is the summary, you know. They said it much more eloquently. They said, uh, you guys made that mess, you fix it. <laughs> you know? And um, so maybe there is some consideration of that, but I think they wanted like, you know, the, they wanted the ceremony, the no global warming ceremony, and we don't have that. <laughs> you know? Then I say, we don't really have that one. I mean, it's not in our repertoire. I don't know, but maybe I'll ask and we'll see. So, you know, that is one source of our knowledge is this intergenerational residency in place. Another source of our, our knowledge is spiritual practice. And I say that because uh, this issue on sacred sites, you know, if you go to a place to, to renew your relationship to the Creator, or if you harvest in a certain, something certain, you know, in a certain place every year, that's what you do, you know, um, for your ceremonial practice. Uh, that's how we get a lot of our instruction. That's where we get it. You know, and I say that because it is so significant to our community. You know, I cannot even express the significance of it. So I said, I'm just a small person in our, in our ceremony, but that is why uh, preservation of native free exercise of religion 
you know, and of these sacred sites is important to our community because that's how we get what you're supposed to do. You know, what you're supposed to do all the time. That's where we get it. We don't get it uh, from someplace else. We get it from, uh, you know, we, we get it from um, those prayers, those ceremonies. So what do we know about natural law? We know that, um, that it's all alive. You know, now you hear these, uh, in the new, the new environmental phases, you know, they're talking about the web of life. Talk about the Gaia principle, you know, that it's alive. Everything's alive. That's right. As we always said, it's alive. Everything's alive around us. In our language, most of those nouns are animate. A lot of those nouns are animate in our language. Word a sin, word for stone in our language is an animate noun. You know, most of these things are animate in our language. We take for tree, animate. Ironically enough, I always laugh at this daba word for car, also animate in our language. You know, but I say that, which, which means in its essence that that means that we recognize them as alive, having spirit, having standing on their own. And so when we reckon with that which is around us, we reckon with it with that respect, that it is alive, has spirit, has standing. And one would do well to treat that which is alive with that kind of respect. And so whatever it is, if we go and harvest, Wild rice, I went picking wild rice this year, you know, up on uh, Blackbird Lake, on uh, Tamarack National Wildlife Refuge. And I go put my same out, tobacco out, to thank that for giving itself to me because it feeds itself, feeds us. That's our practice. Reciprocity, the anthropologists call it, reciprocity. You always give when you take. You always give when you take. Give your tobacco or same out. That's our teaching, because it's alive, has spirit, and you thank for giving its, its spirit to you. But you always have to give something when you take something from our ecosystem. That's what they say. But in addition to that, what we know is you only take what you need and you leave the rest. So just, that's what we say. I tell you those teachings, you know, as best as I can, but because the fact is, is that this industrial society is not like that at all. What has happened here is that, for instance, even the concept of natural law being the highest law in this land. You know, you know how many hearings I go to every year where they're talking about new laws on, on increasing allowable dosages? You know? Increasing radiation levels, increasing allowable dosages, increasing uh, mercury um, emissions. You know? Our perception is, is that we can make whatever laws we want to. You know, this society, we can make whatever laws you want to. We can juggle them. We can trade pollution credits. We could say, well, these people, they won't fish, so these guys can fish. You know? We can do all those things under the law that they create in the society. But in the end, you and I know natural law is preeminent. You know, you and I know that if you put it in the water, you're going to drink it. You and I know if you put it in the air, ultimately, it, somehow it comes back. So we could say whatever we want to, you know, under the laws. But that is one of the challenges we have. We have we've come to think that we are so clever, so very clever in this society that we can make something up, you know, condense it down. I have this uh, discussion up with my tribal biologist here. In the Indian reservations, we have all the bad projects. You know, all the bad projects come to us. And, uh, you know, so we, you know, all these proposals for nuclear waste dumps, right, come to our reservation, you know. Although Hanford's a pretty big dump, but right over there by Yakima, huh? you know. And uh, got these dump proposals, and then you got the, uh, just every really, you know, just bad projects. So then we had the uh, toxic waste dumps, about 100 different proposals for toxic waste dumps come to our communities, you know. And they always got some really good analysis of why it's really a money-making deal for your community. You know, you got that 65% unemployment. This is long-term employment opportunities, you bet. You know, nuclear waste is a really long-term employment opportunity. <laughs> You know, this guy's coming with like one project after another. It's like, you know, that, I don't want to say it's the dog and pony show. It's kind of like the, I don't know, you can't even say the tractor and whatever show. Anyway, so this guy's come in with this uh, incinerator idea a few years ago for my reservation. And uh, they come in with this incinerator proposal and they want to, they, they tell our tribal council that this is the incinerator that does not create any air pollution. I says, uh, hmm, well, why they won't put it here then? And of course me, that's what I would have to ask, you know, I didn't know they actually created one that had no pollution yet. You know, somehow you combust it, 
it must go somewhere. You know, I'm not a moron. You know, I, I took a couple classes in college, you know, but somehow you combust it, it has to go somewhere. So I'm talking to my tribal biologist, and this guy, a nice guy, you know, but he's not really familiar with all these big technologies. He says, well, we got waste problems on the reservation. So what if we just burn it? He says, and uh, then, well, if we just burn it, that'd be good, then it'll go away, right? I says, no. Did you ever notice that, you know, it goes, it turns, what you're doing is you're turning a land pollution problem into an air pollution problem. This biologist, he looks at me, he says, but the wind don't blow this way, right? You know, it's like, inevitably, at some point, it will, you know? But I say that because, you know, these are the kinds of things, you know, you, you have to consider that in the end, natural law is the highest law. This idea of animate and inanimate, I spent a lot of time arguing over, over cutting issues in our area, you know? I, there's this guy, uh, you know, my friends back there in the audience, you know, uh, Paul, he knows this guy too, Chip Bonemeyer, one of my, one of my favorite, favorite, uh, well, what would you call him? He's a Becker County Forester, kind of a logging consultant, you know? He spends all this time arguing with me about, about um, if, uh, if my reservation is full of timber resources, that's what he calls it, timber resources, I call it a forest, <laughs> you know? He looks at it in terms of board feet of timber, I know he's got his little, his calculator there thinking board feet timber. You know, and that is exactly the problem in a lot of the Northwest. You know, in our language, even the English language, the term forest is an animate noun. You start turning everything into timber resources and it's inanimate, and so it totally desensitizes and removes you from what it is your relationship is or what it is that it's something that's alive. You know, it turns it into the enemy, you know, which is what we do and what happens in wars. You know, people become troops or whatever. They, they, they are no longer humans you know, civilian populations, you know, all those things over time. And that is a real, you know, that is a challenge in our language in itself, how we talk about things and how we get into a, a collective denial, essentially, about what it is, you know, what it is that we're talking about. And in terms of the cyclical thinking, you know, um, you know, this is the land where there was salmon. And uh, I don't need to tell you all, but, uh, you know, we can, we, can, we can say that um, in our teachings, you know, in our, in our teachings uh, of the web of life where the things are cyclical, well, you do know, it'll have consequences later, you know. And uh, inevitably, there's a cycle of all those things. Inevitably, there's a cycle. And whether it is the moons, the tides, or the seasons, or the salmon, they go out in the ocean and, uh, you know, you let somebody go out there with a factory trawler and then they don't come back. You know, or you put some dams up and they don't get up. You know, if you disrupt a cycle, a cycle in the end, uh, you have, uh, uh, you have, uh, you have nothing. That's what our teachings would say. And our teachings would also say that uh, you should only take what you need and not what you, not the rest of it. That is kind of the challenge we find ourselves in, I believe, as a society. It's the challenge between these two really different world views. And uh, they have, in their essence, a set of values associated with them. In their essence, they have uh, worldviews associated with them. And they are abstracted over time into corporate um, bottom lines or public policies, or they are abstracted into all kinds of manifestations in this society. But in the end, they are manifest on land. They are manifest on ecosystems. They are manifest on the slavery in which most of creation today lives. You know, that is the reality, you know, is that we never allow anything to live with dignity. Now, I don't know how to say it, but, you know, you look at this, I mean, I'll talk about that buffalo. You know, you let these things live only to a point that, that we allow them, that we allow them, and we have reduced most of the world to al almost, most of the animals in the world and most of creation to close to slavery, close to slavery in the status in which they find themselves. And that is... That is the, 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 the grievous loss that we have. We've lost our relationship. It is manifest in terms of Holocaust of species, the conflict between these two worldviews. You know, um, very, you know, everything is on the verge. You all do not need a lecture on that. But, uh, you know, more extinction of species in the past 150 years and since the Ice Age. About once every, I don't know, 20 minutes a species right now. You know, that 
absence, that loss is so immense. And that same Holocaust has existed with peoples, you know, worldwide and even today. One nation per year in the Amazon rainforest, they say. One nation per year disappears, extinct. You know, just like that. That means that they do not exist anymore. The argument that I make, you know, or that most indigenous people will make is that that kind of structure in society, that level of consumption, that level of a society based on a set of values, which is based essentially on conquest. It is based on conquest. This is a society based on conquest. That level of that, a society based on conquest is not sustainable. A society that causes so much extinction is not in the end sustainable. That is the argument we would make. So let me say that as indigenous people, you know, as our communities and the communities with which I have the honor to work, I find that we are kind of, uh, we are people who have a great cultural wealth. Uh, we do not have a lot of economic wealth. You know, but in the end, uh, um, that's not what it is about. But it is the ability to kind of continue your living, your way of life in some way that is with dignity and which is with respect. And at the essence of these policy issues on, on uh, values, spirituality, and society are many of the issues which we find ourselves faced with. The idea that many of our sacred sites have been totally obliterated. You know, many of them have been totally obliterated. Celilo Falls is a good example of that. They're on the Columbia River. Places that, you know, we have all these stories about that are turned into these industrial waste sites by the time they are done with it, you know, in this society. We have, uh, you know, of our remaining sacred sites that we talk about, they say that there's, well, you know, there's more than this. There's probably a hundred of them that are totally in danger right now. Those places could be the Sweetgrass Hills up in Montana, they could be um, Bear Lodge, you know. It may seem like a small thing. I know the same thing goes here on, on here in the Columbia River, you know, but you have these places, Bear Lodge is what they know as Devil's Tower. You know, when those, those colonists and whoever it was came out there, they name everything that is sacred devil. <laughs> you know, they got Devil's Lake, they got Devil's Tower, they got Devil's, you know, that's because they're afraid of, of us, you know, in our, our practice in those places. You know, Devil's Tower, it's not known as that, Bear Lodge. And you know what, it's really hard to, to be praying at, and, you know, on, that, on that place. I don't, I don't do that, I'm not from those communities. But imagine if you are in, in, involved in your vision quest process and some guy like, you know, with all his, his hiking and, and uh, I don't know what you call those things, that climbing equipment shows up right in the middle of your ceremony, you know? I understand this ecotourism that a lot of people out here like to do all that stuff, but you know, you're sitting out there trying to pray and these guys are climbing the rock around you. You know, that's what happens in our sites. You know, there are so many stories like that and that is like the least. That is perhaps the least invasive. Obviously, you know, having your site knocked down, you know, for clear cutting or mowed over for mining, is pretty invasive to your ability to practice your religious freedom. That is a struggle we have in this society. We are painfully aware of the situation in which we find ourselves today where our communities must go to this society to, to have an affirmation of what is sacred. It's the strangest irony to find yourself. A consequence of Holocaust is that in the end what you have is that one society says this is sacred. You know, we had this big fight in Minnesota over this Highway 55. They want to run this highway through a, a spring that's part of the creation story of the Dakota people. Dakota people say, no, you cannot run a highway through this spring. You know, they run this highway, they reroute it around a military base, Fort Snelling. But they will not reroute the highway around a sacred site. So we go to the hearing to testify after these people have been blockading the road, have been in vigil, have been out there all this time, you know, go out there and they say, um, we go to this hearing, and that's what I said at the hearing. It is so ironic at the cusp of the millennium for one community to have to go to another community and say, to, you know, a community that is new, and say, would you recognize this as sacred? You know, but that is the quandary we find ourselves in in this society. 
It is a similar quandary we find ourselves in, in terms of the buffalo. I want to speak briefly, you know, on behalf of them. And that a lot of you probably know that, uh, that uh, we have a problem in Yellowstone National Park with buffalo. This is a really, really important issue to the Native community in terms of sacred, what is sacred. As I said, I'm not a Lakota person, you know, but what I will tell you is that in our teachings, the buffalo is the keeper of the western doorway. And in our teachings, we are told that the reason that we are alive as Indian people is because the buffalo stood up for us. Our older brother stood up for us. And that is something that we all know. That is something that we all know because they wiped out all the buffalo because they tried to wipe out the Indians in the Great Plains region. They could not militarily destroy the native people of the Great Plains, and so, unable to destroy the native people of the Great Plains, Philip Sheridan, commander of the armies of the West, said, if you cannot destroy them militarily, let us destroy their commissary. Let us destroy their food. And they, so they set apart a, upon a military process of destroying the buffalo. And you and I know from history what happened. 50 million buffalo, single largest migratory herd in the world, was destroyed as a result of American military policy. That was an incredible disgrace to the society. And we will be living with that. You cannot do that to an ecosystem and not expect that there is a change. The fact is, is that the Great Plains ecosystem is the single largest ecosystem in North America, and it has the largest loss of life of any ecosystem in North America. You take out the single largest migratory herd in the world, the buffalo, and then you begin a process in this society, or this is a process which has begun, which is about the mythology of society. Go west, young man, conquer till land. You know, that's the whole manifest destiny. That's the whole mythology of what is progress. You know, and those Indians, a long time ago, what they used to say, this one Pawnee guy, he said, grass is no good, turned over. You know, and he was right. You go out there in the Great Plains and go in the Great Plains today, and where there was once 50 million buffalo today, you got 48 million cattle. In that same ecosystem, you it is almost devoid of biodiversity. In a place where there was once 250 different kinds of grass out there, some of that prairie grass, six feet of soil underneath it, six feet of soil, six feet of roots goes down through the soil underneath those prairie, prairie grasses, and that's how they made topsoil. That's how those, those prairie grasses lived all winter, you know? Those are, I don't know, smart grass, that's kind of, kind of funny. <laughs> but you know, that's the way that they lived all winter. You know, they weren't like, you know, you didn't have to use a lot of special things for them, pamper them. They lived good, you know, those prairie grasses. You had 250 different species of grass you could find an acre of land out there. You go out there today, one acre of land out there in North Dakota, what do you think? Pretty much one crop, you know, one crop. And that crop is pretty much owned by Monsanto or DuPont. You know, first and second largest seed companies in the world. You know, that's a pretty large loss of life right there. You have, uh, you know, massive groundwater contamination out there as a direct consequence of trying to raise crops in an ecosystem that shouldn't be supporting those crops. You have the drawdown of the Oglala Aquifer that exists out there in the Great Plains today. That underlies most of those states like Nebraska, North and South Dakota, that whole area all the way down to Texas. They say that the, the drawdown of the aquifer is the equivalent of four feet per year, water being sucked out of the Oglala. Recharge rate, they say, is about a half an inch a year. They project that the Oglala aquifer will be dry in 30 years. Someone like us, you know, someone like me might ask a question like, what are those smart guys going to do in 30 years? You know, after they run out of water in the Oglala aquifer, after they created a whole agricultural system which is totally unsustainable totally unsustainable. Everything, you know, topsoil. I live in northwestern Minnesota. I see North Dakota every day. It is blowing towards me. You know? Amount of topsoil out there today, about six inches. Original topsoil, 21 inches out there, they say. Just blowing this way. Because you shouldn't have plowed all that land. They shouldn't have plowed all that land out there. So this buffalo issue is an ecological issue. If you look at it in that terms. But to us, it is a more spiritual issue. And that we're told that those buffalo are our older brothers. And um, my friend, Rosalie Little Thunder, who sits on my board, she was asked to perform a ceremony a few years ago out there in um, Pittsburgh. Uh, no, it was called a Buffalo Kill Ceremony, which, um, as I understand, is a ceremony traditionally performed by women. And that ceremony 
is a ceremony in which you ask the buffalo to give its spirit to you. That's what they say. He asked the buffalo to give its spirit to you. And then you hunt. You know, the men would do the hunting, but the women would hold that ceremony. Because when you harvest, you've got to give that recognition. Ask them to give itself to you. So she went, uh, you know, she was reluctant, she, but she performed this ceremony for this buffalo that this man wanted to offer for this uh, feast. And it was a 17-year-old bull. She performed that ceremony, and she said, I was praying, I was praying, I was standing there. And uh, she said, I kept praying and, you know, talking. And she said, I finished that ceremony, and that bull was just looking at me. And she said, I had this immense sense of grief, of grief and responsibility. That's what she said. And then she said, uh, she said, I didn't know what to do. I kept praying, you know. She said, in a little while, that buffalo walked away, and that buffalo, he come back. When the buffalo come back, she said, the whole sky lit up some. She said, and when he come back, she says, all of a sudden, I had this immense sense of relief. That's what she said. She said, she recognized that that buffalo said, all right, you know, I'll give my spirit to you. Give myself to you. And when that happened, she said, she said to that buffalo, you tell me what it is I got to do. I owe you. That's what she said to that buffalo, you know, which is that reciprocity, that relationship. She said, two weeks later, I got a call from uh, this guy named Pat Smith from Salish and Kootenai Reservation. Attorney, he said, Rosalie, come out here. Come out here to Montana. They're shooting buffalo out here at Montana. That was the winter of 1996, 1997. The um, state of Montana, Montana Department of Livestock, shot 1,100 buffalo as they crossed out of the border of Yellowstone National Park. Now, a lot of you are probably members of the Wilderness Society or know about this, but you know, they create this park, 1872, you know, they carve it out of some Indian lands, they try to make a nice thing, but that park itself is not actually able to support a herd of that size. That's a reality. It's a nice, pretty park, beautiful, stunning, doesn't have a lot of grazing lands. You know, the problem is, is that those grazing lands are all occupied by cattle, like the rest of the 250 million acres of grazing land in public hands. You know, the cattle are scarfing up all the grazing lands out there. And as far as I can see, there's 48 million cattle. There's not so many buffalo, you know? We need to have the cattle back off the grazing lands a little bit there. That's what we gotta do. You know, if we talk about a, some of these environmental groups talk about a no-cut policy on the, on the forest, we should have a no-graze policy. Some of these public lands. That's what you gotta do. You gotta back the cattle out of these lands. You know, it's a simple proposition. That's what happens, those buffalo go down there, they get near those cattle, they say, oh no, these cattle are going to get you know, brucellosis from the buffalo. Not a single case of transmission of brucellosis between a cow and a buffalo, or a buffalo, a cow, in the wild. Not a single case of transmission. So I spend my time today, I was working on this EIS, and I, I find this irony returns to me. I'm talking to you about a public policy, and yet the fact is, is that the Indians don't even have a voice in the debate of the federal environmental impact statement process. We should, technically under the law, but who has a, a voice in it? State of Montana didn't even exist till 1890 after the buffalo were gone. You know, a bunch of federal agencies that have no repertoire of experience with buffalo because they were brought about, National Park Service, all of them, pretty much when there was no buffalo left. You know, and still to this day and age, you know, I will tell you, and this is, you know, we could call it whatever we want, we could call it colonialism, or we could call it racism. The fact is, is that our voice, these people who know those buffalo, I know nothing about them folks, you know, them buffalo, but those people who know them buffalo from, had ceremonies for them for, you know, 50 generations back. Remember the time when the buffalo and the Lakota talked the same language, you know? And some of the people even know some of them things. They can't even talk on this policy hearings, you know, because we're not considered to be of stature. I pose that to you because I think that, that is a really a challenge in environmentalism. A lot of these big environmental groups have a lot of influence. And it is important that that influence is used as well to increase the dialogue in this debate. Because it is all of us that are going to make this change. And if you could have, we could have that wellspring of knowledge with us, you know, that is like absolutely key to recovering this relationship. So this winter I bring this issue to your attention because I'm someone who believes like many other Indian people, that at the cusp of the millennium, the United States should quit shooting buffalo. You know? We should quit shooting buffalo at the cusp of the millennium. That would be a really good time. You know, we got a winter coming up again, and they're going to do it again. 
And it is a challenge that we have. We have to expand the park. You know, Buffalo should be able to leave live. <laughs> should not have to be dead to leave Yellowstone. It could be alive. Send it to the tribes. Do not be afraid, though. You know, do not be afraid of this. So from my perspective in closing, you know, I talk about these issues. But those prophecies, which were told for so long, and that I, you know, in my simplest of terms and fumbliest of words try to express to you, are something which are so in our face today as Indian people. As you see a nation of, of Buffalo that tries to return, you know, in our ceremonies they say that, as one old lady, she told me, one of our elders, she said, she talked about this uh, vision, she talked about it, but they tell about this up there in our area, that this buffalo, she looked at this buffalo in her dreams, and this buffalo had, had only one leg, only one leg, that's what they said. Said that they want back their four legs, that's what they said, but she said it took, required our people and it required all of us to stand up for them. That's what they said, you know, that that's the only way that buffalo would be like that again, have all four legs. And that is really the compelling set in the relationship, you know. All of those parts of the creation, whatever they are, whether it is the water, whether it is the buffalo, whether it is the trees, they require humans to actually stand up to their responsibility that the Creator gave them, to stand up and to do the right thing, which is in its essence, the recovery of that which is sacred in the individual, the recovery of that relationship, the recovery of that relationship in policy, the recovery of that relationship in our lives, you know, the recovery of, of what is right. Because we were all raised with the values of knowing and acknowledging that there is a right and there is a wrong. It is actually having the courage, it is actually having the courage to acknowledge that and the courage to to stand up on, on uh, what legs we have for the rest of them, critters. And in that process to recover that relationship to natural law, which in the end is what will guide all of us. Because you and I, we may, uh, we don't come from very different places, you know, in the picture of the world, where Sherman Alexie, the great writer says, uh, what does he say, 99.9% .9 the same, you know? That's what they say genetically, don't they? And even men and women, isn't that an amazing thought? You know, it's like very little that's different about us, you know. You know, we are all relatives, you know. But in the end, um, it, is, it is this uh, collective process of, of uh, calling upon those, those uh, teachings that are someplace in us. You know, they're not in the mall. They're definitely not in the mall. And they're not featured in your fortune cookie, you know. But they are in us, and it is the, uh, calling upon that to... Um, to recover uh, that which is sacred. Misuko Munik Miigwech, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, our panelists, is that right? Going to join us and have some discussion. Miigwech. Yeah. I know. Now the clock.